Last lesson, we looked at comparing two proportions by doing the confidence interval for their difference. Now we're going to look at hypothesis testing. Remember, they can both, um, the confidence interval comes from the sample, and the hypothesis testing is that we assume how likely we're going to find a p value. And I couldn't resist this cartoon why statisticians don't make it as waiters. Hi, sir. I normally distributed the butter on your toast this morning. See the pretty little normal distribution there? All right. So first of all, you'll probably notice this slide did not change at all. The model is still the same. The mean is the difference between the two parameters. I personally prefer putting the larger number minus the smaller number, the more positive minus the smaller. Um, you, you can do it either way. And the null hypothesis is that the difference is always zero. So that's still your null. Your standard deviation um, basically includes the two numbers. Now, we're going to go into a little tweak on this, all right, in just a second. The conditions are still the same. We're still doing randomization. There should be the 10% uh, condition. And notice, this is only an issue for things where we don't replace. Flipping a coin, replacement's not an issue. Rolling a die, replacement's not an issue. It's only when we take something out of the population and, and can't replace it. Also, we still need the independent groups assumption that the two groups are independent of each other. And sample size, we still need that success failure condition that both groups are big enough to have at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. Now, the mechanics changes just a touch. So the reason is, if we assume the null hypothesis is true, that means there's only one p, and I'm talking about the parameter here, for both samples. It's not like they technically have different p-values. You'll see different p-hats. But the populations, both populations should have the same parameter if the null hypothesis is true. So what do I mean? For example, let's say I have a large bag of M&Ms, right? And I pour M&Ms into two different bowls, all right? And I count 16 green. This one looks pretty heavy in orange, doesn't it? 16 green M&Ms in this bowl, and there are 100 total. And 36 green in this bowl, and there are 200 total. Well, if I were to put these two together, well, you would think the proportion here is 0.16 and the proportion here is 0.18. What's really true? Well, if they came out of the same bag, the reason I'm seeing a difference is just because I took two samples. So what we'll usually do is we'll go backwards and say, hey, these two really came from two, this, the same bag. So I'm going to put them back together to calculate the proportion. I'm going to add the 16 and the 36 which would give me roughly 52 out of 300. So it would just be a little over 17%. So we tend to pool the proportion. So we would have p hat pooled, where we put the two samples together, the successes on top, and the sample size on bottom. And your standard deviation, instead of having p1 and p2, it's going to use the pooled for both of them. Notice you do have the sample size on bottom in both of them. And it's not real simple. If these two numbers are different. Some people say, hey, maybe I can just add these two. No, it's fraction math. Just put it in your calculator, because remember, you need a common denominator to add a fraction. Let your, your calculator do it, OK? Then after that, once we get this, the mechanics are exactly the same. We're still going to calculate a p-value. So let's revisit our examples. But this time, instead of doing the confidence interval, now we're doing a hypothesis test. So we're still dealing with the people who attended the weekly meetings and uh, wore a patch, and the people who wore a patch but didn't attend meetings. So the null hypothesis is that both groups had equal levels of su success. Our alternative, we think that group one is probably better than group two, because you're thinking, hey, how can it hurt to have a weekly meeting to add support? So I'm guessing P1 minus P2 might be greater than zero. This is our null, this is our alternate. Okay, so now getting to the model. The model's the same, so we still have to make sure they were random, and they did tell us they were randomly assigned. Um, group one has 46 successes, and group two had 30. And I could check, you can easily see my failures are more than 10 as well. And it is reasonable to assume these two groups are independent. There's nothing to make me suspicious. 
Now to the mechanics. So first of all, if you have these numbers, the x1 and the n1 and the x2, the n2, those are really your critical numbers. Now I'm going to go ahead and show you the hand calculation. But your calculator does a really good job of this. So first of all, what you would do is you would calculate your p-pool, which is 46 plus 30, over 143 plus 151. You get 0.259. Then you find your standard error. And notice how I'm using the 0.259. And where did I get this from? We'll subtract 0.259 from 1, and you get 0.741. The two denominators are different, and I get 0.051 as my standard error. By the way, this is probably not that different than the standard error we calculated last time. Calculate now. What I am doing this time, since I'm not doing a confidence interval, is I calculate a z-value, uh, and I see that it's 2.41. So I'm thinking it's more than two standard deviations away. It's probably a pretty low p-value. So I could do normal CDF, 2.41 to 1,000. But when you have these, I could have just skipped this entire pooled thing here and just used these numbers in my calculator. So let me show you how to do that. So you make sure you press stat, go to test, and then scroll down till you get to the two prop Z and Z test. Then you put in, see the X1 and the N1 from your list and X2 and N2. Now remember, we assume that P1 is greater than P2. So when we get over here, we make sure we select greater than P2, all right? So it's not the same format as we did for our null hypothesis, but it's good enough. Then if you hit draw, I personally prefer draw because it gives you all the information you need. So that little shaded area right there, that's where we're at. And our p-value is 0 0.008. That's a probability that z is greater than uh, 2.41. So based on that, that's a very low p-value. So we reject the null hypothesis, and we say the very low p-value indicates the observed difference is unlikely to be just a sampling error. So we reject the null hypothesis. There is strong evidence that being part of a support group can help nicotine patch wearers stop smoking. Now let's revisit the chicken example from last time, except we're going to do a twist. We're going to compare the Purdue chicken to the store chicken. I uh, remember in the Purdue chicken, they found 33% contamination. And now we're finding that in the store chicken, 45% contamination. So are they better spending the extra money on Purdue? So we're going to do a hypothesis test, which means I need to state a hypothesis. I'm going to go proportion of Purdue minus the store only because I have them listed in that order. Normally, I would actually go the other way because that would give me a positive answer. But since I went Purdue minus store, my alternate is actually going to be that the Purdue proportion is lower than the store. So my when I subtract those two, I'm expecting to get a negative answer. All right. Uh, when I check the model, everything's pretty much the same. It's random. Uh, success failure for a Purdue is still the same. For the store brand chicken, I need to calculate it, and I am getting more than 10 for both of those. And we're going to still assume the independence. Um, it doesn't hurt to hedge your bets saying, hey, you know, they could have handled that chicken at the same time. So maybe there was somebody who happened to have dirty hands that was handling the chicken, and so they would have actually influenced the sample. So let's get through the mechanics. Um, X1, and here X1 refers to Purdue, and N1 is also for Purdue, and X2, so that one didn't change. X2, you notice I'm getting 33.75. My calculator will choke on that number. I need to give it an integer, so I just round it to the nearest. You can round up or down, depending which one's closer. And so I'll use 34 here, and then I have 75 as the sample size. Now I'm going to go ahead and hand calculate the the a proportion that's pooled, so you can see that again, and it's 0.39. So you can see it's kind of between these two, which is what we would expect. My standard error is not going to be that different from before. It's now, except now I'm using the pooled here, and the 0.61 I get from subtracting 1 minus 0.39, that gives me 0.61. So I combine both these, take the square root, and I got 80 thousandths. Okay. Go ahead and calculate my z-score. Since I have Purdue first, I'm going to get a negative z-score. And I'm actually going to look at the probability that z is 
less than that, you know, that's on the left. So what does that look like? On the calculator, it's actually a little more intuitive, I think. So you still hit stat, go to test, and then come down to number six, which is the two prop Z test. And notice I'm going to change the number. So I got 25, 75. And instead of 33.75, I need 34. And then I'll have 75. Now this next part, I want to go P1 is less than P2. All right. So I actually don't have to worry about this negative. And then I hit draw. And so you can see it's actually showing the probability that Z is less than that. And it's pretty much the same calculation. Now with this P value, that's right on the edge. So um, here's a conclusion your book suggested. It said the p-value is somewhat low. So we reject the null hypothesis. You could have actually failed to reject here if you felt so inclined, depending what alpha level you set. Notice how they're hedging here, though. There's some evidence to suggest that the proportion of contaminated packages is greater for store brand than for Purdue chicken. We'd like to know more about the study design before making definitive statements, though. See how they're totally hedging because we're kind of close to that 0.05.